Hey everybody, it's Lon Seidman. It's time once again for your weekly wrap up. Another Monday is upon us and today I thought we would start the first of a series of videos looking back at the prior year and some things that will look forward to the next year. And I wanted to begin with the negatives, the things that let me down in 2021. So let's get to it. Now there will be some nuance to today's discussion because not all of these products are bad, but there's parts of them that I think could have been rolled out better. And we're gonna begin with the low hanging fruit, of course, which is Windows 11. And this was released not too long ago. And we looked at a Windows 11 laptop the other day. This is the HP Victus 16, a gaming laptop that came with Windows 11 pre-installed. And I suspect as the year progresses here, a bulk of the PCs that I review here on the channel will be running Windows 11. And it's great for newer PCs, but the big issue that I and many others had is that Microsoft set a pretty hard line in the sand for hardware compatibility. Namely, if you've got a PC that's maybe two or three years old, it may not meet the minimum hardware requirements to run Windows even though it is capable of running Windows. Windows 11 is not a big change to the operating system, but Microsoft said that they want to focus more on secure hardware platforms. And if your computer doesn't have those chips, it can't run Windows 11. And at some point, Windows 10 is gonna get phased out and you're kind of stuck with a perfectly functional computer with no way to upgrade the operating system or secure the one you have. Now, while I don't doubt the sincerity of people at Microsoft who say security is why they're doing this, the real reason though, I think goes back to the corporate suite because 2020 was the biggest PC sales boom that the industry has seen in close to a decade. That of course was due to the pandemic. And now we're starting to see things tail off. I'm seeing traffic on my PC videos tail off because everyone that needed a PC got one. And Microsoft needs to find some way to keep the momentum going here and get more new PCs sold. And the reason why Microsoft wants more PCs sold is that they get a cut of every computer that rolls out the door from any manufacturer because of course they have to license Windows. And I think that's the driver behind this. Adding to this theory is the fact that Microsoft has revealed a way for the technically inclined to remove the security requirement and get Windows 11 installed on a PC that might otherwise be listed as incompatible. And they know that most consumers are not going to do this. And I think this is the real driver here. So for all of us complaining about it, here's the way you can get it done on this article on PC Gamer. It'll link to an article that Microsoft published themselves on this topic. But for everyone else, they're going to get that notification on their computer. They're going to jump into Windows Update and see that their computer is not able to go to the newest operating system. And that, of course, I think might coerce some people into buying a new computer even if the one they have is fully capable of running Windows 11. Now, while we're on the topic of Windows, my next gripe involves running Windows on an ARM processor. There has been, in my opinion, zero progress made over the last year in getting the ARM version of Windows at parity with the Intel version. If you're just living in the Microsoft ecosystem, I think it's fine. Uh, we're seeing now a few laptops starting to make their way out to the market like the Samsung Galaxy Book Go we looked at that's pretty affordable and the more expensive HP Elite Folio. Both performed adequately within the Microsoft ecosystem, but the compatibility on Windows 10 ARM for Intel applications, especially 64-bit Intel applications, just isn't there. They're buggy, it's slow, a lot of stuff just doesn't run at all. So they've got a lot of work to do and I was hoping Windows 11 would really show a big jump in all of those areas and unfortunately it hasn't. So I think they've really got to up their game because Apple has demonstrated just how good an ARM experience can be on a mainline PC operating system. And it's kind of crazy we're not seeing that development on the Windows side, even though they have been running with a shipping operating system running on ARM for much longer. So we'll have to wait and see what happens in 2022, but I'm not holding my breath here. The one thing that both of these laptops did provide though was great battery life. And that is definitely uh, something that I saw on both of these machines, but that's about it. And I think they've really got to step up the game for ARM because consumers are going to be seeing what the Mac is doing and want that on the Windows side too. But I am not gonna let Apple off the hook here. As you all know, I bought the new MacBook Pro a few weeks ago. I bought the 14 inch one. 
I'm very happy with it. It's a nice computer. But what's been interesting throughout the whole course of using this device now in my day-to-day -day workflow is that I am appreciating my MacBook Air with the M1 more. And the reason is, is that I'm not seeing a big performance difference for the stuff that I do on the Air versus the Pro. I'm not running to the Pro to do things because it's faster, because in many cases it isn't faster, especially when it comes to outputting videos that I produce here for the YouTube channel. The video encoder is the same one that's on my MacBook Air. And the big problem I see here with all of this performance that they've baked into this chip is that there's not a lot of software that takes advantage of it. So case in point, I could run out and get a gaming laptop with a nice NVIDIA GPU on it running Windows, and I'll be able to find applications that make a lot of use for that. So for example, I'm running vMix right now on a Windows 10 PC. It can handle, I don't know, 15 or 20 different HD video streams simultaneously and composite them and mix them all together. It does some really amazing stuff. There isn't an app like that on Mac. OBS doesn't even run, I think, on ARM-based Macs at this point. So there's a lot of power baked into this chip but not a lot of things that are making use of it. And my fear with these MacBook Pros is that they might go the way of the iPad Pro, where there really is not a robust software ecosystem that can show off or take advantage of the potential of these devices. The new iPad Pros are running with the Apple M1 chip, and I don't think there's a single app out there that really pushes those iPad Pros to the limit. I bought an iPad Pro back in 2018, and I never saw any applications that really pushed that thing further than my kids' entry-level iPads could go. So I'm hoping perhaps maybe Apple does some investment into these developers to encourage a greater ecosystem around the M1, because I think right now for people that are looking for a high-performance computer, an Intel-based machine or an AMD-based machine with a nice GPU is going to have a much broader software library, even if it does consume more power. And next up is all of the nonsense involving set-top television boxes. And we're going to start with the push to make advertisements centerpieces of all of these things. So if you have an Android TV device like an NVIDIA Shield or an Android-based TV, you never saw ads before, now you are, and you can't turn them off. This NVIDIA Shield on the desk here was purchased back in 2015. It got an update and suddenly I've got ads that sometimes play videos that I cannot turn off. Even my uh, television, an LG OLED TV, which didn't have ads when I first bought it back in 2016, now has this area that has a rotating advertisement every time I want to switch apps on the television. And what drives me crazy about this is that this LG television has not been getting any new features, but they did figure out a way to extract more value from me by putting the advertisement feature on my set. And that really rubbed me the wrong way. You can make the argument with the NVIDIA Shield that this has been a continuously updated device since 2015. It is probably the longest running device getting updates in Android history, but still it was sold as a premium device. Users who bought this were expecting, I think, an ad-free experience, which they largely got throughout the device's lifetime. Now all of a sudden there's ads on it and you can't turn them off and I definitely understand why people are not happy about that. But my biggest area of concern right now involves Roku. I have long recommended Roku devices to friends and family because they're very inexpensive, they're very easy to use, they're very simple in their approach, and they were largely content agnostic. They just wanted to provide a good way for viewers to consume streaming content no matter where it comes from. But that has changed because Roku got into the content business and found there was a lot more money to be made off the content than off the hardware that used to be the core of their business model. And as such, they're getting into these contract disputes. Uh, the biggest one right now involves YouTube and Roku. We talked about this story in depth a few weeks ago. At the end of next month, it is very possible that you will not be able to install YouTube on new Roku devices, nor will you be able to get an update for the existing YouTube app. That is going to knock off this platform that I earn a living on uh, from millions upon millions of people. 
Roku is the market leading platform and the fact that we're getting into these battles over apps is just ridiculous for consumers, but that's what's happening. Certainly there's going to be two sides to this story whenever this gets resolved, but right now it's not looking good and I don't think anyone wins here, especially consumers who stand to lose a lot of great content in my opinion. Now if this wasn't bad enough, there's another fight on the horizon between Roku and another big content provider, this one Amazon. So it's possible, according to the Android police, that we might see the Prime Video app drop off of Roku next. And this is over Amazon's IMDB TV service. That is a free advertiser-supported streaming service in direct competition with Roku's Roku channel, which is also free. There is big money in this advertiser-supported business, and Roku's market advantage is that they've got the market leading TV box here in the United States. And if they can funnel their users into their content, they're going to make a lot more money. And that's why they're willing to just toss off YouTube and Amazon because the upside for Roku is significant if their competitors are not on their platform. Now we don't know the whole story here, just like we don't know the whole story with YouTube, but I'm starting to see a pattern here of all of the free TV providers getting raked over the coals by Roku. And I have a feeling it's about the fact that they stand to earn more money by throwing their competitors off. And so this is the next thing that's on the horizon. And just to give you an idea as to how much money there is in this, Amazon hired Judge Judy for IMDb TV, one of the highest paid syndicated television people of all time. So there's a lot of money on the table here. And unfortunately, consumers are going to be stuck with less choices or they're going to have to have a separate box for each different channel that they want to watch, which I think is kind of nuts. So we'll continue to follow this story. I have a feeling that Roku and YouTube might be working out their differences. It's been quiet now for a couple of weeks with that deadline approaching. If they were having really irreconcilable differences, I think both parties would be more aggressively communicating at the moment. So hopefully they're getting close to closing a deal, but now we got to keep an eye on the Amazon one. Uh, so stay tuned. I think our friendly Roku Universal players may not be as universal as they once were. And my fear is that these kinds of fights are going to start happening with other platforms too, which is really disappointing. But stay tuned. There's always more to come on this topic. And that is going to do it for my list of tech letdowns of this year. Maybe there's things that I've missed. Maybe there are things that you disagree with or maybe things that you agree with. Let me know in the comments below. And if there's enough to make another one of these, I will do so before the year ends out, but we will have some more positive looking pieces as we get closer to the end of the year. Now this week's wrap up is being brought to you as always by all of you. And I wanna thank some super chatters who popped in during one of my live streams the other day, Keith Robinson and Grayson Petty. We have no new supporters this week, but we still have many people who support the channel on an ongoing basis. And of course, those of you who watch on a regular basis too are equally important because all of those things equal channel growth. And if you want to support the channel, you can. You can go to lon.tv support and make a monthly or a one-time contribution to the channel. We support the YouTube membership program, Floatplane, Patreon, and my own donor box page. You can find me on a bunch of other places and platforms as well, including an audio version of this show as a podcast, which should be available on most popular podcast feeds. We're also now on Spotify in video form too, so you can find this show in its entirety there. And then of course, we've got my Amazon page at lon.tv slash Amazon shop, where a bulk of my product reviews appear completely ad free, so check it out. We have my very infrequent email list at lon.tv slash email. We've got the Facebook group and we've got the Discord, which is starting to get a lot more activity. My notifications keep going off on my phone, so I'll be popping in there a little bit more frequently, at least I'll try to. And then of course, we've got my store where I sell previously used items that I reviewed here on the channel and I'm now getting rid of. And as we wind down for the holiday season, that store will get hopefully a little more active with new listings. I have a pile of stuff that I keep talking about over there that I haven't gotten to yet. Um, but be on the lookout. I will be adding some things throughout uh, the rest of November and December there. And there's only one of everything. So if you want to get notified when I add something to the store, you can sign up for the uh, email list that is up on screen at lon.tv slash store alert. And that is going to do it for this week's weekly wrap up. Thank you all for tuning in and listening to my gripes about the tech that let me down this year. I'd love to hear your thoughts down in the comments below and definitely let me know what let you down too. All right. 
So that is going to do it for now. Until next time, this is Lon Seidman. Thanks for watching. This channel is brought to you by the Lon.TV supporters, including Gold Level supporters Hot Sauce and Video Games, Brian Parker, Chris Allegretta, Tom Albrecht, Thomas Anfang, Jim Tannis, and Handheld Obsession. If you want to help the channel, you can by contributing as little as a dollar a month. Head over to lon.tv slash support to learn more. And don't forget to subscribe. Visit lon.tv slash s.